Hi, my name is Julia Sogi, and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at Posit, formerly our studio. And today in this screencast, we are going to look at this week's Tidy Tuesday data set on um, childcare costs in the US. This coming weekend is Mother's Day. Um, I personally am a mother and um, have thought a lot about childcare costs during, you know, my time as a working mom. Um, this particular data set uh, is, is pretty big, it's rectangular, um, and it has a lot of variables that are related to each other, that are, you know, correlated predictors. So I'll talk about this a little bit more in the, you know, as we get going, but because of that, I, that makes me want to reach for um, XGBoost from my, from my toolkit. So we'll talk a little bit about that. XGBoost can take a little while to um, uh, train and tune. So we'll also talk about how to use early stopping, which is a way to use the data that you have, especially if you have quite a bit of it, to learn about when to um, stop. So let's get started. Okay, time for machine learning. So let's start by reading in this data. It is of, of pretty big size here. Let, um, I can do glimpse to kind of get an idea of what this looks like. There's quite a lot of features, quite a lot of um, variables, and it is pretty good size. So um, like I said in the intro, in situations like this, I often turn to XGBoost. And as I, as we get a little bit further, what I'll, I'll say a little bit about what about this data makes me think, aha, XGBoost, I'm gonna use XGBoost here. Um, one of the aspects of this data that makes me want to think about using XGBoost is that a lot of these variables are related to each other. They're, um, they, they are correlated, right? So, so this is um, the poverty rate for families, and then I think the poverty rate overall, or, and then here, this is the, um, I think this is the, the, one of these, some of these, we've got the unemployment rate, we've got, and, and so it's divided up, the employment rate overall for men, for women, um, or actually I think that one's not the employment rate, I, um, we've got the number of households, which of course is um, linked to other things that are counts, right, like other things that are that are um, big, like the total population. So when we have so many things that are related to each other, they're not linearly independent, tree-based models like XGBoost tend to handle that pretty well. Um, let's do a little bit of exploration of EDA of what it is that we're looking here. So there are different estimates for the childcare cost. Um, the S I think means school age, and then we have infant, toddler, preschool, and then the ones that say C are for like a child care center, and the ones that say F C are for a family based care. Um, so there would there be different ways we could estimate this, but let's let's say we're interested in community based. Or sorry, center-based care for school-aged children. So let us make a few, um, a few plots with that. For example, we could start with, um, with the year, with how has this changed over time. So let's put study year on the x-axis. Let's put um, study or the, the measure of child care costs we want to put on the y-axis. And then let's do um, box plots like this so we can just um, see this over time. Ah, okay, I need to, let me say group equals study year. So this will do one for each year like that. And we can, um, you know, if we think this would be nicer with some color... Yeah, we can do this, make it colorful to highlight, and maybe we think those blues are not what we're looking for. We can do like a, I'll know, I can use one of the Brewer Color palettes. I think um, there's like 
blues or greens or I think there's like one that looks like this, I think. Yeah, okay. So you can see, what we can see here is that over time, the cost, so this is the weekly cost of childcare um, for school age children in centers, it is going up. You know, no, no shock to anyone, uh, probably at all, but certainly no shock to um, anybody who has paid for childcare anytime recently. You can see it went from, so if this is this is 50, 100, 150. And the median went up quite a bit from like 70, 80 to over 100. All right, so it's going up over time. We can, so the data here is at the county level, and we have data for uh, many counties over many years. So, and then we have other information about what, what is in the, what those counties are like. So let us, um, Let's look at another variable. So let's see, let's look here. Let's look at this. So this is the mean household income. Let's put that on the X axis. Let's put this thing we're gonna try to predict on the Y axis and then we can, um, we can set a color. Let's look at, um, let's look at these. These are the female labor force participation rate. So this is all women, this is women with under, kids under six, this is with women, age, you know, kids between these ages, and I think that's these two things together, if you have all of them and so forth, and this one I think is the male labor force participation. So let's look at, um, I don't know, let's just look for all women, like does, so what we're going to see is, um, does the child care does the child care costs change? Is it, is it different when we see different household income and or different women's participation rate in the, in the labor force? So let's make a point. There's a lot of this data. So let us, um, let's do that. Let's change the color scale here. I'm gonna use Viridis, my favorite. Uh, scale, color, viridis, C for continuous, like this. And also, let's stretch this out a little bit because I think like what, like many times when we see things with um, income on it, it is not it is not normally distributed, but kind of log normal where there's a lot of counties at these lower um, me median household income and only a few at the top. So if we do it with... Um, the log scale we can see a little better okay so what this let's drop this a little more so what we can see here is that um child care so the you know if we kind of divided this in half and like looked at the left side and the right side on the left side which remember are the low income counties the cost of child care is sort of flat ish but for high income, for, you know, the other sort of side, we definitely see, we see this increase here where um, childcare costs are higher in the high income counties. Also notice we have this, uh, you know, the, we see this, you know, like shifting color here, which is the women's labor force participation. So women's labor force participation is lower for low income counties and it's higher over here in the middle to maybe that you know the high income county so women participate in the labor force more in medium to high income counties and in low income counties they are not working nearly as much so that's pretty interesting, and that's the kind of relationship that we'll want to um, try to use to um, write a to build a predictive model. Let's do one more. Um, you know, in the U.S., a big thing that impacts what your life is like is your is your race. So these are the these are the percentages of people who say they are one race. So for white, black, um, American Indian, Asian, and Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. So. Let us make one more exploratory plot. So let's take our child care costs. Let us, so I'm, I'm gonna reshape this a little bit so I can put it on one plot. 
I am going to say I want the, um, the thing I want to predict. Um, let's throw something else in here so we can maybe use that for color. Let's do the household income. And then let's say start with one race. This will also get this one, which is how many people said they were one race, and that's versus two or more races. And so I'm going to take that one out. So now I'm going to take out just regular old one race like that. And then I'm going to use pivot longer. I'm going to pivot all those one race ones here. Um, I could put in some more um, arguments to give those the non-default names, but let's just, let's just keep going. Um, so let's make a plot here now where uh, the percentage is on the x-axis. The um, the cost of childcare is on the y-axis, and then let's make the color that um, that um, measure of household income. Uh, these are these are in twenty eighteen dollars. So like we saw in the plots, we have different we have different years, but they've all been normalized, uh, like the effects of um, the effects of inflation taken out. Okay, and then let's do let's do the same thing here. Uh, except we won't want that because our what's on our x-axis now is between zero and a hundred. And let us do let's facet wrap this so we see those um, these different races and different little small multiples like so. And yeah. Okay, let's see what this looks like. So I'm noticing there's missing data here, which is probably because, um, I mean, something is NA value, so I'm probably going to need to deal with that before I build a model. Uh, let's make the scales free X, because there are, there are many fewer Asian, Hawaiian Pacific Islander people in the U.S., so we want this to be more, um, let's make this so it's easier to see. Okay, fantastic. All right, so let's look at, let's, for example, look at um, uh, the black population in the U.S. So when um, a county has a high proportion of their population being black, the income is lower, right? This is, you know, a well-known thing in the U.S., right? Like we we understand this. This is part of what it, like big impacts on where, on, on um, people Americans' lives, and the um, child care costs are lower. So in counties that have a lower proportion of their population being um, black then um, the child, the income is higher, median household income is higher, and also child care costs um, can be higher. We do have this big spread, though. Kind of the opposite thing is happening for um, populations that have lower, uh, you kind of see the opposite thing going on when you go from a lower to higher proportion of the population being white. Um, we... You know, the American Indian shape looks kind of like the, the shape for black um, Americans. The Asian one looks kind of different, right? Where it's like um, the, we, we kind of see almost, you could maybe even draw a line through this. I don't know. So we kind of see more of a trend, more of a trend there, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so we see these, like this is, you know, this, um, in America, these things are super linked, right? Like the racial makeup of where you live, household income, and it turns out also child care costs. Okay, so let's call that as being good for our um, EDA, and let's go on to build a model. I am going to load the... Heidi Models meta package. I'm going to take um, this. Let me do glimpse one more time so I can look at what we've got here. So I want, so let me take the childcare costs. I need to take out all these other, all these things. 
because I certainly don't want to try to predict one child care cost using another child care cost. I want to try to predict it using characteristics of the um, of the county itself. So I can put in a, um, a, a regular expression here, matches. So I'll put the regular expression inside of quotes. So it's, um, I don't want ones that start um, MC underscore, and I also don't want ones that start MF, right? Matches, it would help if I spelled it right here. So let's, um, let's make sure I did that right. Okay, so now I only have this. These, I am going to try to build a model with these. So like, like um, you notice all these female labor participation rates, they've got to be related to each other, right? I'm going to put them all in and let XGBoost figure it out. So, um, uh, I, so this, notice this is a big data set. This is a data set with a lot of columns. This is a data set with columns that I know are related to each other. These are, I think, earnings, like um, median earnings, median earnings for men and women. Of course, those are related to each other. But XGBoost is a kind of model that can handle that. So this is rectangular data that's pretty big that has correlated predictors. When I am in a situation like that and I just need to move forward, what I do is I pick I choose XGBoost. I just throw it in there. Um, the other thing I noticed that was here is this FIPS to FIPS code. So this is every county in the United States has a FIPS code. And so what this is doing is it's just literally measuring what county you're in. And I don't really want to build a model with that information in it. I would rather look at some of these other things um, because this is, I, you know, I'm sure this will be super important if I put it in. If I just say, like, what's most important, like, where you live is most important. So I am going to um, I'm going to take that one out too because I think um, that's not really the kind of um, that I don't want to use that information inside of the model. So now um, I do, I am remembering that I had um, some missing data. So I'm going to do that. And so the, the, you know, taking out the missing data takes it down a bunch, but boy, that is still a lot of data there. And then what I will do is I will um, pipe that into initial split. And I'm going to do stratified initial split with the outcome because stratification often helps and seldom hurts. Let's see, safe, safe thing to do. Um, I am need to set a seed here. And then after I have that, I am going to make my training and testing sets from the split. I'm going to make my test set, and then I need to make something to use for tuning. Since this data set is pretty darn big, what I'm going to do is I, so I'm going to make, like, I could make, I could make, like, folds here, like, like, cross-validation folds. It's pretty big, though, so I'm just going to make one validation set, validation set, like so, and I pass it the training data. So this is going to be like I take my training data and I split it into um, two pieces, one piece that I'm going to use for training the model and the other piece I'm going to use for assessing um, different possible models. Okay, so if I run all this, whoops, I did, no, no, I did this wrong. Um, validation split, I'm sorry, that was wrong, like that. Okay, great. Okay, so what, so what I have for training data is this much um, data to actually train models, and this is what's going to be used to assess the models as I go through, and because we're going to try different hyperparameter configurations. Okay, time to make the model. Uh, let's talk briefly about feature engineering first. These are all numeric, and I am not going to do any feature engineering. I'm just going to pass all this data into XGBoost. I'm not going to try to deal with the fact that I know these variables are correlated with each other. I'm just like pushing it on through. Um, 
there's no dates to deal. You know, like I don't have to do any kind of any special feature engineering here. So what I'm just going to instead use um, a formula, a basic formula. Um, again, when I see data like this, it's rectangular. It's all numbers. There's a lot of it. I know or suspect that it's highly correlated. I'm going to choose my old span standby XG boost. Um, I am going to um, uh, try to make this process go a little bit faster um, by using early stopping as I tune. So I'm going to make a boosted tree model. It is going to, um, here, let me, before I move on, I'm, I am going to, um, uh, let's see. I am going to um, uh, use the XGBoost engine. And this is a regression problem here because I'm predicting the childcare cost, which as we saw in that, those plots is like, you know, a number around $100 a week. And what am I going to put in here? Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use early stopping. So what that means, I'm going to set trees. I'm not going to tune the trees because what early stopping does is say like how many boosting um, like uh, iterations did you do. So I'm not going to tune the trees because that wouldn't make a ton of sense. I am going to um, set it fairly high, um, medium-ish, you know, like to one value. And I'm going to let early boosting, early stopping tell me when to stop the boosting process. I am going to tune min n and m try. I am going to tune the, um, the early stopping, how many iterations of boosting to go through before stopping. I'm going to tune that. And then I'm going to set the learn rate pretty high um, to make help it try to go faster. Like maybe I'm going to give up some performance on the model, uh, how well the model predicts in, in, in pursuit of it, just like going faster through, hopefully. Um, since I... I'm going to use early stopping here. I need to go in here and I need to say how much um, data does XGBoost need to look at while it's boosting, saying make more tree, make another tree, make another tree, make another tree. Like how as we're is it's going through that process, how much like what data should it look at to um, to decide if it's getting better or if it's time to stop the boosting algorithm. So I'm going to put point two here. What is this? It's 20% of what? It is 20% of this number. So the training data is going to go into the XGBoost algorithm and internally it's going to hold 20% of this back to decide when to stop the boosting algorithm. So this one, this is, you know, it's kind of a lot to keep, uh, keep straight here. We have a training set, a test set. We have what's called a, um, a validation set which is this over here. That's what I'm going to use to choose between hyperparameter configurations. And then in this case, this data set is, which you remember is the training set. This data set is also going to get divided um, into 80%, 20% inside of XGBoost, and it's going to look at that. Okay, um, let's put these together in a workflow. Um, I don't need special... Um, I don't need any special, um, uh, um, pre-processing here. So I'm just going to use a formula that looks like that, which means predict this measure of childcare costs with all the rest of that stuff there. And then I'll put in my model specification. So this is a tunable model specification. So here we go. This is, this was what it's doing. All right. So now this is ready for me to tune. So I am going to use, um, parallel processing because it can try the, um, it can try the different, the different hyperparameter configurations in different workers. I'm going to set a seed because, um, this involves randomness. The XGBoost algorithm involves randomness. And then I'm going to tune. I'm going to tune. Um, what am I going to tune? I am going to tune my workflow with what um, data am I going to like measure how these different hyperparameter configurations are acting? 
with the childcare validation set. Uh, instead of doing it like 10 times, like we might with cross validation, we're doing it one time uh, with our validation set. And since it's so big, um, we think that I think that's um, good enough. I am going to bump up the default here so we can see. Um, Try it. Try a few more values of these different things, and I am gonna kick it off. Let me just double check. Tune grid. Um, excellent. Let's look at control grid. I'm trying to remember how the parallelization works. So parallel over. over um, resambles or everything. Okay, so it's going to do an inner parallel loop over all unique co combinations. Okay, perfect. So I can just leave this as is. Of course, the, the defaults are great, no shock there. And um, so what it's gonna do is it's, I have 15 possible models, model configurations, and it um, I'm going to try all of them where I train on my, on this data, what we call the um, analysis set, and then it's gonna be evaluated on the assessment set. So 15 models, each of them will be tuned one time. Remember that inside of XGBoost, of that data that I sent it, it's actually holding 20% back to um, decide when to stop, um, when to stop the boosting algorithm moving forward. So. This is a pretty big data set and XGBoost, um, you know, like it's going through many, many trees. So this is going to take a little bit. So let, I'm going to pause the video here. And then when I come back, um, uh, we'll see how it turned out. All right, it's all done. That actually went pretty fast. I probably could have kept talking that long. <laughs> Okay, but it's done and now we can evaluate how things went. So let's start by um, visualizing the tuning results. Let me um, zoom in here. So what this looks like to me is um, we see the lowest values for our MSE, which is good, and the highest values for R squared, which is good, kind of at the, you know, high M tri, low min N, and higher value for how many, the early stopping, how that worked. So, you know, if I were gonna go back um, and do this again, or if I were, like if I were on a real project, probably what I would do is go tune once more and extend the value that I'm tuning over to higher values of M tri, lower values of min N to see if, does this flatten out here or does this keep improving? You know, see, see what goes there. But in the interest of our screencast here, let us keep going. Okay, so I can um, pull out what are the best ones of these, like this. I can say RMSE like that. Um, uh, if I wanna be more explicit about what I am choosing here. And notice this one is the best one. So it's this high value of M tri, low value of min n, um, and a um, kind of a medium value for how many boosting uh, iterations to go through before stopping. Let's look at that, um, this value. So this is the root mean squared error on our predictions compared, like if you, uh, measured with the validation data. And it is around a little over 20, that's $20, because this is the median price per week for a school-aged child in a childcare center. Um, so remember that number was like on the order of $100. So we are able to predict the childcare costs in a county, you know, with a root mean squared error of a little over $20 um, with this model that we trained. We can, so let's say we're going to choose this top one, this best one. For XGBoost, you know, there's not usually much reason to do anything but um, the actual best value. So we just, what we do is we will finalize the workflow. We will, we will, instead of choosing, showing the best, which is like the best five or so, we can select the very best one and then we can use last fit 
And last fit. And we will fit to the child care, that initial split, the training and testing split. So let's call this child care fit, like so. So I'll kick this off. So what we're doing is we're taking the workflow that was tunable and we are updating with these values, these values here, and then we are fitting one last time to the whole training set. This includes that validation set. This includes that um, um, that uh, data that was held out internally to, um, you know, do try find out the early stopping. So, um, or is that true? Maybe not. Um, uh, we take the whole training set, we train it, and then we will um, we will evaluate on the testing set. So these metrics are measured with the test set. These are predictions on the test set. And this is the workflow trained on the training data. So we can pull some of those results out. You know, we could say collect predictions here if we wanted those predictions. Let's just look at the metrics real quick like this. So here are the metrics from the testing data. So these up here were from the validation set. This is from the testing data. Looks like we don't see evidence of overfitting. And remember, this is the root mean squared error in dollars on this, this weekly price. And this, what this measures is how much of the variation in the prediction, how much of the variations in the price did we end up explaining with um, our model. Another, one other reason I really do like XGBoost is that since you have the tree structure, you can get out um, variable importance. You can do some um, explainability. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to pull out the fitted workflow. And then from there, I am going to um, pull out the parsnip fit here. So the pull out the model. So this takes the workflow and goes inside and pulls out the... Um, the model, not just the feature engineering. And then I'll use the VIP um, function. This makes a plot. You can also do, um, you know, you can do different kinds of, um, different, different kinds of variable importance. I'm just going to use the default, which what this does, and I, what this does is it goes into the, um, and I think I like it as points. Geom, this isn't right. Geom equals point like this. So, Oh, yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. So what this kind of variable importance uses the tree structure, like, you know, there's a bunch of trees in this model and it uses what are the trees like to, um, to tell you what is driving the predictions of the model. So look like the, the importance here, um, the most important is the, is that what population of the, what proportion of the population in the county is Asian? Um, that is one of the, that is the most important predictor in this model of, um, of, uh, what childcare cost is. I bet that's because this is really linked to where people live in the U.S. and in a way that tracks these childcare costs. The next thing is the mean household income. So, um, you know, and we saw that was a really dramatic uh, relationship. We saw that in a plot. Then this one, the this is the women's mean or median earnings. So how much, so what's, you know, something related to the racial makeup of the county, then something about how much do households bring in, then specifically how much do women bring in, and year comes after that, uh, like measuring the effect of time, households, so that's, is it a county with a lot of households, or is that a very, is it like a rural county, so this is like urban rural, and then we keep going. So um, these are the, these are the um, uh, predictors that the model learned to be most important. It's one of the reasons I like using XGBoost in situations like this. Is just, this is pretty useful information to um, come out. This is a this is a measure of how the model behaves um, overall. What is driving the model overall? And now, if I was doing this in a real project, the thing I would end with, the thing that comes last here, is setting up this model for deployment. So I can um, use the vetiver package. And what I'll do is I'll do the same thing here. I'll pull out the, I'll pull out the um, fitted model. And then I will pass that to 
vetiver model. So I'm, what I'm doing, and I what I need to do is I need to give it a, a name here. So let's say child care costs XGB like this. And so this will be my ve my vetiver model. So what this thing is that I've just made is a deployable model bundle. This is ready for me to then um, version and deploy, and then I could monitor this if I was going to, you know, like have new data coming in on child care costs. So um, a modeling process, uh, it's important to ask, when are you done? And for many cases, the, um, the goal of the model that you're building is actually to deploy it. And so this would be the next step that takes you there. All right, we did it. We were able to use XGBoost with early stopping to predict the childcare costs in counties in the US. We, it turns out we were able to predict the, um, the cost uh, to about $20 um, a week on you know, um, uh, these values that are on the order of 100. So that's the kind of performance we were able to achieve. We at, um, walked through how to um, understand variable importance for XGBoost. And then at the very end there, we built a vetiver model, which is what, um, what you can use to start your ML ops process, the process of versioning, deploying, and monitoring your models. Um, I am teaching a, um, a workshop at PositConf uh, this coming September that is gonna focus on deploying deploying and maintaining models with Vetiver. So in the um, blog post I'll publish with this, I'll be sure to include a link in case that's something you are interested in learning more about. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you next time.